Okay, so today I'm going to talk about QGIS in the world, the telecommunication design with QGIS and PostGIS. So my name is Justin Chang. I'm a GIS analyst with Mobia. And uh, Charlotte Gallant, who's the integration specialist, has been with um, myself from day one in um, making this uh, happen. So for our agenda today, I'm going to talk about briefly about who we are, since I think uh, some of you are not familiar with Mobia, and then I'll go about talking about GIS at Mobia, how we use GIS technology and Mobia, and we're going to actually talk about Mobia engineering design system called MEDS that uses the QGIS and PostGIS technology. So Mobia is a leading expert in digital transformation. So we are um, innovative enterprise technology. A company. We started off in the telecom business and then we kind of um, moved into other business as well. So uh, Movia has an expansive technology solutions offerings and we do offer uh, digital transformation services. And Movia is proud to be recognized as one of Canada's best managed companies and Canada's top growing companies. So we are based in Canada and we have 37 years of incorporation and we have 700 employees across North America. And our headquarters are here in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, in the Eastern uh, end of Canada. And we have offices in Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, Moncton, and the United States. And we are a business and technology integrator. I mean, we help our clients with digital transformation projects and enterprise technology solutions. So Mobia also recently um, delved into healthcare and we provide healthcare solutions developed for healthcare specific use cases. And we have whole, over hundred vendor partners as well. And some of the um, technology solutions that we provide are um, modern IT methodologies, application services, hybrid cloud solutions, cybersecurity, and next gen networking as well. And I'll jump into a broadband and wireless solutions, which is where I belong and where the GRS team kind of belongs. So we are part of the wireline wire uh, team where we provide GIS services and um, we do a lot of things with GIS. And here are our clients that um, we interact with. Now, briefly, I'm going to talk about GIS at Mobia. So uh, at Mobia, we provide a wide uh, array of um, services from spatial ETL to field detailing solutions to GIS analysis, as well as enterprise GIS deployment and spatial database management, web mapping, customized GIS service. So basically um, everything GIS, so to speak. And at GIS, at, um, so as a GIS analyst at Mobia, uh, although my title or many of our um, coworkers' titles as GIS analysts, we do a lot of different things. We also do spatial analysis, as well as uh, database administration, uh, depending on the project. And we do also work with uh, proprietary technology as well, like Esri and Schneider Electric, uh, um, Ericsson, and Geocortex as well. And in terms of field collection, we use Ike, Trimble, and many more. So let's go into Mobius engineering design system. So in the get-go, we have three really essential problems that we wanted to solve. One is location, and one, one is uh, we had a lot of constraints. And also we had a data management issue with, regarding all the files. So in terms of location, um, our initial client was based in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and our project manager was in Moncton, New Brunswick, and our designers, most of them were in Windsor, Ontario, and we also had designer in Vancouver at one point, and our GIS personnel, all of us, most of us are, were in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I was in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Charlotte was in Windsor, Ontario. So everyone's is all over the place. So we had to kind of find a way to kind of work together. This is before the pandemic. So we kind of were kind of preparing for 
this kind of uh, tool or this kind of um, system before any, everything happened. And then we had a lot of constraints that we had to kind of um, face, a lot of issues that we wanted to address. So one of them was that we had CAD designers, but they had minimal GIS experience. So there needs to be a lot of documentation and training and has to be quite accessible. Um, kind of like um, some of us has to learn it and relearn it and kind of uh, teach, each, teach each other about those skills, right? So that was kind of one of the constraints. And we, do, we did have a limitation in budget. So we wanted to kind of, kind of do a pan-Canadian kind of a system where everything, everyone or everyone's kind of remotely connected, but also um, work with CAD designers somehow. And there's the data management side of things. We wanted to store geospatial data in a central location. We wanted multi-user access, depending on the user, like whether it's a designer, whether it's a GIS technician, whether it's someone that just wants to look at what we're doing in terms of design as a viewer. And also on the other side, um, apart from the, all the backend stuff of implementing it, we wanted to have some kind of system where we wanted to customize the template and also share the styles without the pain of sharing files via email or kind of sending through uh, Microsoft Teams or Zoom. We wanted to find a much elegant and much efficient way to kind of share those templates and styles. And we also wanted different permissions, um, which is kind of like what uh, multi-user access kind of do for you. So we kind of wanted all this uh, function and we found a solution in, of course, in MEDS. So MEDS is uh, an, it's, it's an acronym for Mobia Engineering Design System. It's a design tool for design technicians in the telecom um, sector and uses open source technology. And we use PostgreSQL database, basically PostGIS, and we store maintain, and maintain the, the data in that database. And all these plans are drawn using QGIS. So in the back end, we have PostgreSQL or PostGIS, and we have in the front end QGIS as a client software that we use to draw. And before we get going, we have to kind of understand where Mobia kind of do our work. So we have to think about the fact that we also do a lot of field collection and we collect the data. Um, and then we kind of manage it. The data manages is where um, GIS technician come in, comes into play and field collectors uh, play a part in the field collection. And the designers are designing the data that has been collected and QC'd or kind of maintained by GIS technicians in the, in the, in the data visualization and analysis side of things. So I just briefly want to talk about Ike. So this is our primary data collection tool that we use to collect pole data. So we are collecting pole attachment heights, anchor location, span measurements, clearance heights, all that jazz using this tool called Ike. And this is just the kind of a, like the view that you will see in, a, um, in Ike office where you can see that just from a poll, there's a lot of information that in one point. And once we collect those data, we manage the data in our database. At Mobia, we use an enterprise system. Um, we call it MEDS, but it's actually using QGIS and PostGIS technology. So all that collected data from Mike or or, or data that's provided by a client would be housed in a PostGIS setup. And the benefit of having an enterprise GIS that is centralized and because we use QGIS, we can share templates and styles across the board easily, instantaneously. And also we have the multi-user and permissions using the PostGIS um, native functions. 
Well, actually, we're using PG admin. So we actually use PostGIS and PG admin to kind of manage um, the database. So from a QGIS, QGIS or QGIS, as our European friends and other friends all over the world call QGIS, um, the benefit of using QGIS or QGIS is that there's so many things that you could actually um, utilize. And one of the things I, I really like, or I think a lot of our um, coworkers agree is that the attribute form has a very, um, it's very customizable and it's very good in terms of coming up with a solution for, um, in our case, designers to draw and have a lot of um, drop downs and a lot of um, conditions that kind of look, um, applies to their everyday drawing, draw work. And also the symbology and labels, it can be customized really well. So it, it really helps us in terms of developing this tool. And the native processing toolboxes, um, processing tool, we, it's in the processing toolbox of QGIS, is quite helpful. And one of the really um, tool that I really like is called Hublites. And it's called, it's Hub and, it's using the Hub and Spoke algorithm. So in, that, in our case, we could automate uh, a way to draw lines using two layers and using the columns of that is shared between the two layers easily by using this uh, tool in QGIS. And there is a lot of plugins that you can utilize. So one of the benefits of using QGIS is that there's a lot of uh, plugins. I can remember like uh, last year, there were around, uh, I could be wrong, but like a, less than 500 plugins. Now it's posting 930-ish plugins. So it's a very robust kind of a uh, plugin environment. So it's an ecosystem that kind of, um, so that you can actually get functions that's not native to the software itself, but there's a lot of add-ons that you could, or extensions that you could use. And one of the, I guess, favorites that I have is Quick Map Service which basically gets you the base maps of, let's say Google or Bing maps and other um, cool base maps and lat long tools, which allows you to kind of, you know, if you want to know um, um, basically, basically the coordinates of a place, you can use this tool to kind of find it out real quick and kind of use the, the tool to kind of um, figure out where the location is and whatnot. And of course, the mask tool that you could use for masking as well. So this, these are just three, but like, I think Cliff has a very good video of showcasing some of the cool plugins uh, from QGIS. So please check that out. And also, I think you can also incorporate a lot of the um, web feature services and web map services, as well as REST um, layers that um, a lot of the municipalities and uh, uh, provinces and other places that kind of um, uh, has open data portals. So you can use those data in QGIS easily and kind of bring that in and kind of use it for your purposes. So that's kind of, uh, I think in a nutshell, what I think up to now, what I think the QGIS is, is beneficial for us. And in terms of PostGIS, um, other than the fact that it's stored centrally, it enables you to use spatial SQL. So whereas the regular database would not allow you to use um, spatial SQL per se, because it doesn't have a spatial information, uh, PostGIS allows you to kind of do analysis. So I would, I, I think this is the word by Paul Ramsey, who's the founder and creator of PostGIS. Um, he says, you can do GIS without the GIS, I mean, with a, without the GIS basically. So. You don't really need visual to do GIS with uh, spatial SQL, as long as you know what you're doing. So that's pretty cool. And uh, you can also have a lot of scalability for PostGIS. So for us, we started off 20 users last year, and currently we boast about 160 users. And um, basically with a minimum staff, a minimum uh, of GIS personnel is involved, you can actually scale your uh, business or your corporation, depending on how many users you want, and you can expand it pretty quickly. And uh, I think few uh, last week we actually had 
a uh, few servers um, online as well at, at the same time. So it's pretty neat how you can actually uh, scale your servers and also move your information in a kind of a smooth transition way. So it was pretty cool in terms of uh, using PostGIS and uh, QGIS together. So let's get into the data visualization analysis part of MEDS. So MEDS is a basically a design tool for designers. So it's only natural to actually show you how it actually draws. So we in, in a, you first have to understand the fiber to the home architecture. So this is, you're actually putting um, feeders from a central office and you're also putting distribution from a central splitting point, we call them CSPs. And through the network access points, you're drawing drops to each um, houses or dwellings. See? And um, for cable, um, cables, like as you can see in this picture, there are many sizes. Like, you know, this is a, let's say this is a size 12. That means there's 12 fibers in that cable. And cables come in aerial format or buried format, aerial meaning that is on the poles, in the air, buried, being buried on the ground. So we had to represent this in a distribution uh, plan. And this is how it's drawn. So I'm, if I'm drawing an aerial cable uh, with a cable ID A, then this will be how it's drawn inside METS using QGIS. And let me show you how it actually looks like when I'm actually drawing one. So I'm snapping to the poles to draw these cables. So I'm showing where the cable is in relations to the poles. I'm selecting aerial cable, I'm selecting cable ID and the size, how many fibers are in that and then I select the type of um, si um, cable that I'm drawing. And also it's uh, natural that in, in a teleco uh, design that you want to show terminals and terminals look like this in real life. You probably saw this while you're walking somewhere and we represent it as a, in, in one of our projects as a T and the red tea being something that's going to be added, tea, the black tea being something that's existing. And they place those teas on those um, poles. So I'm not really a designer, so I'm, I'm just trying to show you how it works. So for those designers out there, telecom designers out there, um, I might not be accurate in what I'm drawing, but I, I'm just wanted to show you the functions of a meds. So when I'm placing a regular terminal, I would, you know, select, kind of tell that what kind of cable ID size is it, how much of it I'm using, and then kind of represent that here as a regular terminal. And the next one, same thing, but I just want to show you a different um, kind of uh, drop down. So this time I'm, I'm an MPT, but I want the size to be 10 out of 20. So it's an MPT. So it, as you can see, it's represented as MPT. And I'm also going to show how you're going to actually draw work plan labels. So basically uh, fictional F9, some Dartmouth world, and then I'm gonna actually account. So it's a 12, size 12 uh, terminal. So the count and then like that. And another one, it's called uh, future terminals. 
So for those who are wondering what, how those labels kind of differs is I'm just using a lot of SQL conditionals in the back. So QGIS allows you to actually kind of program it for those labels to what you want to do. Like you can actually have it to show different uh, colors. And in our case, if it's a MDU, it's in this case yellow. And if it's a commercial, it's a different color, whatnot. And as you can see, I, when I chose MPT, it becomes blue, things like that. And for the work, work plan labels, a lot of the uh, functions are kind of automated so that the designers make less mistakes. And we also draw pets. Pets are things that you probably, if you're walking around houses, you probably saw this. I saw one this morning while, while I was walking too. So these are connection point for underground cables. So that means there's underground cables uh, beneath this. And um, so these are kind of shown as the symbols. And for our project, these symbols were actually drawn by myself and some of our, my colleagues. And I also used the uh, open source uh, software called Inkscape to draw these uh, symbols. They are, uh, Inkscape is, is quite easy to use. And uh, I'm using them as point uh, in this case to kind of place those pets. Yeah, so placing a pet. And drop down, choose a selection, and some of the drop more drop downs. Yep. Okay, so that's a simple ped. Then um, I do have a lot of different uh, things that I kind of use. We use to kind of show um, show our show notes or show slacks. So for the slacks, we're using for 3.22 QGIS, you have this function to create a shape auto, like, without actually drawing one. So, well, not drawing per se, like eye drawing, the QGIS draws it for you. And all you have to do is populate that field for you. So it's, I think for circles, squares, and things like that, you can actually do um, those kind of symbols and using the, the native feature of 3.22. And I'm, I'm showing you how you can do annot annotation now. So if I want to have notes in different colors, this time I'm showing you cable notes. So for cable notes, I made it, I code it so that it will show yellow. And if I'm doing something like conduit notes, I choose annotation and choose conduit note, and it will come in different colors. Yeah. And for the colors, uh, you can do RGB, you can do hex, you can do uh, CYMK, whichever is comfortable with you. So that's pretty cool too. And these are the final products that our designers have drawn and actually submitted to our clients. So, so they are actually representing a lot of things on a map. And uh, the benefit of having a centralized database is that it's always there as long as the database, we maintain the database. So they can come back and fix things. And um, from let's like a coworkers perspective, if someone um, is kind of busy and he can't come, come to the project again and to fix things, um, he can easily come in and just continue onwards with the work without uh, hassle because everything is there. It's not sh file sharing, basically. So that's very convenient. Of, um, it's actually a, a added convenience of using an enterprise GIS. And I, I can't emphasize enough about PG Admin. And uh, PG Admin is the GUI or GUI that we used uh, to actually maintain our PostGIS database. And we can, um, I, I think in the very beginning, I used this just to kind of uh, maintain the database, whatnot. But more and more so, I find myself in the back end of the things. I 
this is much easier in terms of creating layers, like in seconds, using SQL. So it really is a it's really brilliant that they have this, and then you can create ID and passwords to uh, to databases, and also get permissions and everything. So it's it's a valuable tool that you would need, and it's open source as well. And using um, PG admin and PostGIS, you can do a lot of SQL analysis. I think one of them was uh, finding perimeter length of protected areas. You can just do with three lines of SQL uh, query. And you can do also like area water, things like that. But like for us, we found a way to kind of use it for our day-to-day -day operation. So uh, it's still evolving. So we, for example, if you're counting houses within a boundary, so we would actually use a ST within or ST intersect, depending on how, uh, how like if, whether you wanted to, you know, find those points that are e even touching the point or only within, and also the sum number of units per dwelling within the boundary and whatnot. So by doing that, I think we saved a lot of time, but like in the beginning, it's like for this one, these ones, uh, it only saved so much, but like if it adds up, uh, it saved a lot of time. So it took like two minutes or more to just do it uh, using a select by location for um, selecting boundary. So select by location is a, you can do that natively in QGIS, but like uh, you have to open the, open the tool, you have to kind of select the layers and things like that. But if you know what you're doing, you can do that in seconds. Sorry. And another um, cool thing that you can do is you can customize that. So with select by location, for example, you can actually just do so much, but like if you know how to do your uh, statements um, in, in SQL, you can actually kind of give them, like you can do a conditional within the uh, query and actually um, join tables with something that are kind of easy for the user, like for instance, uh, it would be much easier for our designer to kind of um, use like the boundary layer where it has the FSAs and exchange. FSAs are fiber service areas and they're normally numbered like 101-1, 101-2 and exchanges are the area that they, they actually are looking at. Um, so it's like an exchange, let's say Halifax exchange, which is not, but like, let's say, and then within Halifax, there's 101-1, 101-2. So you wanted to actually do counts within those FSAs, but you can actually do that with um, SQL statements by you know, interchanging 101-1 with 101-2 and even Halifax with something else, like let's say it's Dartmouth or Bedford, you can actually change that and you can change the condition as well. So you can fine tune what you're doing uh, depending on, um, what, uh, what you're doing. And for this process, uh, I was observing a, a designer. It took them more than 20 minutes, actually, mo actually more like 30 minutes or plus, depending on the area. And it took only 10 seconds using SQLs. So that kind of shows the power of using uh, spatial SQL or within post GI setup. And there are a lot of uh, statements that I think that are quite valuable, I think, uh, for this in terms of spatial SQL. Um, I can only, I could think of ST intersect distance and ST within, but there's um, other, th other, there's so many. So if you refer to the post GIS documentation, there's more that you could actually refer to and think about how to use that for your um, purpose. And I think I want to emphasize the importance of using training and documentation. And um, the, for QGIS and PostGIS, it has great, great documentation. And it's actually uh, very searchable, I would say. So like, as you, as you can see, you can find the training manual that's quite useful. So you can actually go through a training manual and kind of get the, um, all the functions learned in, in, in not one go, but many goes, I guess. And um, it's you can always Google and find those information there. And same goes for PostGIS. Uh, there's a lot of useful um, tips there. 
So for us, um, I use the training manual to kind of make videos uh, using the tools I had. Um, we had we're using a Microsoft three three hundred and sixty five uh, suite. So I was using uh, Microsoft Stream to make videos. I was using um, um, Teams to kind of um, also interact with our designers to actually get the training done. And also recently, I think I'm I'm delving into kind of documenting some of the documents into OneNote. So um, OneNote has versioning functions, so it will be easier and much approachable for uh, many or many um, folks. So whether it's your designer and you're, you want to, you want to add more documentation to the training material, you can for us. And um, I've also looked into markdown language and whatnot to kind of document things. But um, I think at the end of the day, you have to remember that not all folks are um, are kind of familiar with all the te technical aspect of things. So it's also important to kind of um, trying to use what's available to you. In our case, it's what's Microsoft suite of uh, tools. So I try to use as much as possible so that uh, it's more approachable for my organization. But training and documentation is very important. And I think, I don't know how many documents I created for our purposes and, uh, and videos, whatnot. So it's essential. It takes a lot of time to do it. And because I had some documentations and videos made um, uh, in, in, in um, collaboration with Charlotte and other uh, members of our, my team, I was able to kind of um, do other stuff. Like I could actually do training, but um, the basic training could be done by having designers look at some of the videos, some of the uh, training material, and then kind of come to us regarding the geospatial or GIS issues that they're being ha having. So it kind of frees, freed us up in terms of uh, dealing with uh, the database issues and the front end uh, QGIS issues that uh, came about as well. So um, the takeaways from my experience and um, also Charlotte's experience as well is that um, there's a huge cost benefit to having an open source setup, uh, QGIS and PostGIS. I wouldn't go into too much detail about it, but like, of course, there's the cost of having the laptops, having the personnel, whatnot. But like, uh, it gives organization the freedom of spending uh, like the budget, if you are having a budget limitation, it gives you the freedom to actually delve into um, GIS um, without worrying too much about, um, let's say, if you are just doing front end application client side uh, GIS stuff, then maybe, maybe uh, QGIS. But like, if you're also wanting to kind of like us scale a bit and kind of uh, expand little by little, um, there's a uh, there's, of course, there's cost of the server and whatnot, but like still, in terms of software and in terms of database itself, there's definitely a cost benefit to it. And also there's the benefit of customization. We can, um, I mean, I, I, I didn't really, we didn't really create, uh, invent, reinvent the wheel, but basically we're just um, sitting on the shoulders of giants, basically of who made QGIS possible and PostGIS possible. But for us, we could actually customize some of the front end, the, the client side, the things that we want to use for our purposes. It could be small things, but something more complex. So it, that's the benefit of using an open source um, software and uh, database. And as a ge ge spatial or GIS professional, it's, very, it's, it's an enriching experience for both myself and I believe Charlotte as well. Because like we also look at front end of stuff all the time, but with PostGIS and QGIS, you also look at the back end of things, the database, and uh, how things go about. So although it's minimal, I wouldn't say back end, back end, but like still, you kind of see under the hood what goes on. Like when you do uh, use QGIS and uh, you do deal with other things that you wouldn't have dealt with when you use a PostGIS or QGIS setup. And um, you, you kind of think about more like in terms of the database architecture and how some things work. And um, also 
for us, I think uh, we have, I think four different, I think four or five, I can't top, think about the top of my head, but I think at least four different projects and different provinces. So everything is happening at the same time. And then you think about projections for schemas and whatnot. So some of the things that um, we didn't really think about, we, we kind of uh, learned as we go through this process. And um, like some of the some of the videos that um, like, for instance, Cliff's videos and uh, Paul, Paul Ramsey's videos and other things, it always helps us. So it's really um, approachable and enriching for a subject professional, GIS professional to learn and also relearn and actually uh, in some time, sometimes give back to the community as well. So that was a really um, enlightening and enriching experience as a GIS professional. Okay, Cliff, uh, I think I'm done here, so. That was great. Thanks, Justin. Thank um, so any, if anybody has any questions, please drop them in the Q&A and I will get to them. I have two pages of questions, so we're good to yeah. go. Um, <clears throat> first question, um, when you're working with field data collection, I know you're using an Ike and you're obviously using the yep. RTK, you're using the Trimble and a variety of other devices, I'm sure, um, across the country. What is, have, I guess, first part of the question is, have you tried using any of the um, open source uh, data collection software, like Merge and Maps or QField or anything like that? Um, and then the second part of my question that mm -hmm. relates to that is, how do you mm -hmm. get the mobile data into uh, your database? Is it a manual process or do you have some sort of automation set up? So the first part of the question, um, we are, I mean, I can't say, for, I, I, I can't represent um, Charlotte. And Charlotte probably would be a better person to answer this question. But uh, she's since her, she's the inter integration specialist. Her role is to kind of look at the whole process of integrating the field collection to the data data management side of things, as well as how things work out. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are always looking into avenues uh, like merge and map that came about, and we're we're just looking into it. Um, but not at the moment. We we don't uh, we're not using open source at the moment, but that could actually be a possibility in the future, depending on um, different projects. It could be a small project that we can start off. Even for Mets, it started off with tw I, I said twenty, but it was even less who actually used it, and now it's like a full fledged uh, design tool for us. Then we could actually use it for different provinces at the same time. And for the second question. Uh, once that field collection data comes in, we do have specialists that kind of auto, has an autom automation in terms of uh, QCing um, the data, field data, so before putting in that into QGIS. Now, I can't really say uh, in detail how that goes, uh, how that process goes, but I can just say that there's an automation, somewhat automation process and a process um, manually to put that in in the database as well. Right. Yeah, because I could imagine the QA process is important, right? You, yeah. you don't just want yeah. to take data directly from mobile application into uh, your DB. Plus, there's probably modifications you have to make in field names and things like this. Yeah. So we um, have a specialist, yeah. Stats Wong. Shout out to Stats Wong. He's also, uh, I went to school with, but he he does that part. So he kind of QCs and so that the, all the um, survey data comes in, you know, Nice and nice and good, and then kind of make sure that everything is, looks good on in the QGIS side of things, so that the designers can draw using those poll and dwelling data. Okay, yeah. excellent. Um, we have a question from Raphael. Um, you mentioned Mobia entering the medical field. Can you expand on how that relates to geospatial data and how your expertise is required in that specific project, if you can? So for that, um, for the medical part of things, I, I can't really speak for that. Uh, per se, because um, I have limited knowledge on on the miracle part of things, but we do have a, a um, kind of a application called SearchCon. So I, I advise if if you're interested, look at our um, uh, website mobia.io. There's more information on it, but uh, not yet. I know, like the like you know the very beginning of GIS, you could actually trace back to Jon Snow's cholera map and whatnot. And there's a huge history of you know mapping and GIS with health data, but um, at the moment um, 
I could say that I, I, I have limited knowledge on to answer that question, but um, it, it's something that is quite interesting. I mean, we could actually think about, you know, going into GIS in terms of the health um, sector as well. Yes. Right. Um, I love your training. I love that you set up videos as well as documentation. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a bunch of questions on that. One, yep. because I've done this before. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a lot of pushback when you're migrating a CAD user to using uh, GIS? Is that is that a hard process to train them, or do you find that eventually is it is it is it or is it an easy process to get somebody who has traditionally used CAD to do this type of design, and now they're doing it within a GIS environment? Uh, it depends. Like uh, I, I said, CAD designers, but um, there are designers who had experience using Esri software. Um, for in the telecom world, um, there's the network engineer, which is using um, ArcMap to in the telecom space. So some some designers have experience with network engineer and Esri. So it's easier for 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 me to explain things. Whereas um, for just straight up CAD, um, it's uh, it's a process. It depends, like because uh, it's it's completely different. You have to explain about coordinates and well, not coordinates per se, because they don't really uh, worry about that too much but um there's like the layers you have to explain that you have to turn for qgsc every layer has this edit editing uh edit, you know tool so basically uh you have to edit you have to open that editing tool for each layer and whatnot so it's a process yes and uh, it's a challenge but like i guess once they, they dive into it and they get used to it um they're okay with it I hope. <laughs> so far, I think it's okay, going okay since uh, we have 160 users. But uh, I guess another challenge would be uh, how, you know how in GI software, it's all done in like the map view, whatnot, and, you know, printing the map or in the layout is kind of the last thing you do. But I find that a lot of the, the CAD designers and designers per se, they spend a lot of time on the layout view also. Yeah. And that's that's where I think uh, I, I hope more improvements come with QGIS mm -hmm. so that um, it's much more intuitive in terms of, um, but uh, to be fair, um, compared to like, let's say 3.16 to 3.22, it's a, there's a lot of improvements and yeah. I'm just, I'm very hopeful that, hopeful and very optimistic. And, yeah. but like, it's but a again, different- There's a disconnect between, you know, mm -hmm. your map view versus your layout yeah, view. Yeah. Right. That's another thing. So like uh, I showed you about terminals and whatnot, those data all automated or kind of um, kind of tweaked using SQL to kind of label it right? like, yeah, but like you would, but like there's the side of, you know, you wanted to sh represent that data in the layout and um, there's a disconnect. Yes. So yeah. It's, yeah, it's uh, it, coming from a CAD. I just mean disconnect by, you know, when you're coming from CAD, the design you make is the layout. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so in G GIS, you sort of have to think differently. You're like, no, we're mm -hmm. going to data first, and then we're going to use those data, and we're going to okay. produce some sort of layout. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, so next question: um, Are there any plugins in QGIS specifically for the telecom designers? Uh, have you seen any, or is that, or is there a need for that? Is that something where uh, you know, oh, it'd be great if there was a tool that did this? I know there are. Pro proprietary uh, companies that have their own like QGIS based software, like, but like, it's not free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no open source. Yeah. 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 Tools or plugins out there that, yeah. that do this. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So I'm really curious about your growth. And I, and this is one of the things that I always talk about with clients is the scalability of, mm -hmm. of an open source GIS stack, particularly mm -hmm. with uh, Postgres. So from 60 to 160 users, what kind of growing pains, if any, did you have? Or was it a fairly seamless process of just, all right, well, we have more users, eventually we'll <laughs> add a second server, um, or was it was it a painful process? So I would say, um, yeah, so it's not really a GIS issue that we were having, it's more of the database issue. So like, also it's a learning experience. I, I, I said at the end, end of my presentation that the, it's a learning experience because you kind of go in the back end and things. So I wouldn't never have imagined this problem, but like um, there's the issue, always the issue. If you have too many users, 
there's a uh, problem. So we, we used to use one server and the more we grew, uh, we had to scale it. So the, right. the point where you want to scale it is kind of really difficult to know unless you have the experience to do it, right? Yeah. So that's, I guess, uh, in hindsight, that's kind of like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say pain, but like our experience, our learning experience, yeah. like having known, if, if we hadn't had known that, we would be much more prepared. But right. even though we weren't prepared at that point, it was fairly smooth in terms of transitioning to new servers and accommodating 160 users from, let's say, 100 users early this year, almost, and then kind of, you know, booming like in months. And then we were able to turn it around, um, of course, with the help of our IT and whatnot. But still, it was really um, considering how long we we kind of worried about it, and but like the actual execution wasn't that. I mean, it was really excellent. It was really smooth. Awesome. No, it's great to hear. Yeah. Um, one question I have is that uh, having right now, I, as I mentioned to you, I'm designing a telecom design database for for another client. Mm -hmm. um, how do you? And one of the things we're up against is is managing the different styles for different clients. So if you have yeah. Bell, if you have Rogers, if you have Telus. Um, there might be different symbols that each client will want on the end result. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you manage that within within QGIS? Um, at the moment, I mean, so we started small. So we have like all the symbols have different, there's different symbols. Like I would say like um, conservatively 50, it's not even 50, I, I would say 100 symbols that we created. So basically... In the, in the beginning, it wasn't an issue because we just had one client, but like now we have four or five clients and different. So um, we, we kind of, at the moment, we're kind of naming the symbols different way and kind of servicing and have the symbol housed um, together as one package for the designers. They, have, they just have to update their symbols, add right. these new symbols and whatnot. But... It's going to be a problem, yes, because um, some provinces, some clients have different uh, standards yeah. and symbols, and there's so much you can draw with. This. I, I was drawing with Inkscape. I was like the the drawer, the <laughs> database manager, <laughs> you right. name it. Yeah, uh, but like, yeah, it it kind of, um, but it's an interesting, uh, but like it's something that I was kind of in the avenue of thinking, but. It's a good question, yes. And how do you, um, cause like also you have to think about where you house those symbols. Yeah. And embedding could be one option that I, I didn't, we didn't really get into, but you can embed those symbols in the styles itself and you right. can share the styles as well. But um, ch uh, kind of checking whether it comes out all right in a PDF or whether they, they print it out. We don't print it out, I don't think, but even in a PDF format, if it doesn't come out in a good resolution, how do you resolve that issue? So it's, that's something, I guess, going forward is uh, something to think about. Something to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, last question I have for you. Um, using your forms for data entry, um, I assume you have you know database constraints in place, not null constraints for certain fields, foreign key mm -hmm. lookups, things like this. Trigger functions maybe to automatically populate yep. certain fields to concatenate or generate, you know, determine area, mm -hmm. length, things like this. In the end, how much is it a major time saver? And I assume it is, this is why I'm asking the question. Is it a major mm -hmm. time saver for, from a QA perspective when you get down to actually reviewing the data before it's submitted to a client? Um, how much does that represent a big time savings for you? Yes. So um yeah so we're in the process of trying to kind of automate a lot of the things so i'm, I'm actually gathering information as i speak uh, about some of the data integrity issues that comes with design so that didn't happen before because that's more like um, they could just edit it in their cad file or whatnot but yeah. now it's open to everyone in our unit organization so basically you could see the their pattern so um, it's definitely beneficial. And that's kind of being addressed uh, little by little because they, they say, this is wrong. How do you address this? For example, um, I think if I go back, uh, 
for slides. Sorry about this. Yeah, no, go for it. Um, oh, sorry, here. I don't think you can see it basically, but um, when I was showing the video, there was a, here, here. Yeah, so terminals, I think this is the one. So here, uh, let me just quickly show you. This was here. Oh, sorry, it's the pets. Sorry. I think it's the middle of here somewhere that I showed you guys how to make a work plan label. About this. Yeah, so here. You can see that this is a work plan. It doesn't. It it seems like a like a before we used just a text field one yeah. by one. Yeah. And as you can see, it's it's. I mean, it's, you're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. So you probably have typos and whatnot. So the second line is like automated. So that when you kind of select a size twelve, this is automated with the twelve embedded into it. Right. And so the twelve and twelve would kind of match. So. It, so it, I don't know if it answers your question, but like no, it does totally because it just saves you yeah. time. Like I guess I guess my question was was really on on data integrity and QA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? So I like it saves a lot of time. Yeah. So also this is just one of the design uh, kind of I, I guess our way of um, work around or solution to that issue. But even with if we do that um, to human is to error basically. So you would actually have some mistakes and. You would uh, so we're kind of thinking of how do you batch solve some of the like you know automate it like automate maybe, the process of QA yeah, that's really interesting yeah. actually I've, so I've, yeah. so basically um, we do have automation before coming in but after auto coming into QGIS it's a different matter so uh, I think Py QGIS is another option Python in QGIS and yeah. also um, some queries views and there's there's yeah. I think a lot of options that um, I think we can consider. Yeah, but definitely yes. So these are things that I think we didn't think about beforehand, but like thought was 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 possible, and now we know that it's possible. So there's a before QC of the data that comes in, but like after you draw, then we were thinking more about how to kind of uh, check for mistakes and how to correct them, and what are the mistakes, what are the common mistakes, what are the pain points for designers as well. So. That's kind of uh, where I think we're heading in terms of solving the QA and QC issues. Awesome. So actually, I have another question because I want to ask this one. We have yeah. a minute left. Yeah. Um, officially, again, <laughs> I could have talked about talk to you about this all day. But um, backups, restorations, this is really important stuff. Um, and different organizations kind of manage this a little differently. Um, so my question for you is this, you have a junior designer that just came on board, you, you opened up the, a project to them, you gave them full editing privileges on, on the project, they accidentally deleted 10 points, mm -hmm. Best save and committed that to the database. What's your restoration process for that? Is it long? Is it a quick fix? So if uh, this is a really good case for a post GIS documentation, uh, uh, I think I mentioned my friend Stats Wong before, but like um, he kind of showed me this documentation that about the history tables. Yes. So we create history tables in the PostGIS database so that what happens is when you draw cables, it kind of shows you, I mean, it kind of records all the cables that are erased and created at the same time. So you would have the data of who created, who deleted it. And the history table would kind of catch that initially. So that's one, one way of actually catching it and then quickly you know, um, restoring it after we re reference it from the history table. But another way is we also back up the database quite often. So we can restore it to a certain date and kind of restore it. But like that's, as you know, it's quite painful because you have to stop the work and kind of re revert back. and. Yeah. Some people were doing work, right? So that's uh, sometimes not feasible, right? Yeah. So that's the two layer I think we have at the at the moment. Yeah. Um. So we don't have history layers for 
history tables for all um, tables that would be a process and that's using trigger functions right. uh, basically it's, it's just selecting all the recently drawn and then it gives you it, a time span when it was created who created whether justin deleted without knowing that he did or, or something yeah. like that so you would actually know what happened so that's quite 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 helpful because like I, I looked at post chat documentation i was able to create that really easily yeah. and uh kind of resolve that issue yeah because we had a tight area for a project and we couldn't find a find out why this cable was being erased right and we we kind of found out that what a designer was uh by mistake um kind of thought this was kind of something loose something and then he kind of deleted that but like he kept deleting that line so <laughs> who's doing it? yeah yeah but like we were kind of worried in the beginning it's like if this is a database issue it's a big issue because you're losing data right so yeah. but we found out it's not really a database issue per se it was human someone was mistakenly erasing it so we found out who did it so we could actually go to the person and kind of show them how to use the let's the let's say the filter function filter yeah. function of qgis so that he would see only his cables in his uh, area, or he could use mask and whatnot. So yeah, it's interesting how you would actually um, kind of interact with these problems that you haven't really thought about, but you kind of fi find these pro uh, solutions through the documentation and the forums and whatnot. One idea, one idea that somebody gave me, mm -hmm. and uh, I now do it with a lot of databases, is I restore yesterday's database to a backup mm -hmm. database on the server. Mm -hmm. I only have uh, admin access to that because the last thing you want is for somebody to accidentally start working in the backup database. <laughs> that way that if today anybody accidentally deletes something, you don't have to restore anything. You just have to access the yesterday's database, find mm -hmm. the feature that was deleted, copy, paste mm -hmm. it through QGIS, paste mm -hmm. it into today's database or the current yep. database, uh, and then you're done. Yeah. Um, so it was a really cool idea. Like, oh shoot, I, I picked that up. As long as you have space on your server to have basically mm -hmm. two versions of your database at all yeah. times, uh, it's yeah, it's another nice way to do it. Lots of different strategies, but the, what you're doing sounds like it works. Yeah, um, and also you could actually have, let's say, uh, I don't know, a, a separate computer that you kind of have like a, in parallel to what you have, and you back it up and yeah. kind of store it there. And then when you have issues, you can always, like you said, copy that. Yeah. Um, and export it out and, you know, copy and paste it in QGIS and you're all set for those important ones. We also restore to another VM. We'll just spin up another VM and, and restore yesterday's backup and then grab whatever. It would. Then connect in QGIS, you connect to that that server, the backup mm -hmm. server, restore mm -hmm. whatever points you want. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of ways of doing it. It's all. Yeah. And there's also, the, uh, you have to remember, there's versioning Yeah, uh, that you could look into, but like... Um, we kind of didn't go to that route because right. uh, versioning also kind of entails a lot of sophistication of the database. And then uh, what if the person, I mean, offline too, uh, it's also very helpful, but like, what if that person's computer is, you know, no longer and then he forgets to sync it. Yeah. So how do you <laughs> get around that? And there, there are things that uh, you kind of didn't think about. Uh, right. You have to think about you, you like in, in in a structural way and also like in a usage like a workflow way as well. So and 160 users. There's there's the you know the way the way it works ultimately is the last user to save wins. <laughs> um, so you can easily rewrite. I have that with projects a lot. Is that projects are saved within within mm -hmm. PostGIS. Mm -hmm. And if I make a change, mm -hmm. somebody else makes press save on the QGIS project. Well, their save wins. Mine is gone. Yeah. So earlier we had templates stored in the database. And then what happened was uh, uh, by mistake, they would just override it, all yeah. the, the perfect templates. And so I have to go in and kind of re-put that, re -put the actual templates there and yeah. whatnot. And I think another thing that you could think about is kind of backing up your styles. Yeah. So sometimes you think the default will stick and you'd be, you'd be okay. But like, sometimes you want to go back a couple a couple uh, months ago that you, you had that style, perfect style that you, you liked, and you want to go back to that one. If you kind of back up your style somewhere, 
Uh, in our case, we could we start back it up at SharePoint, and you could actually go back and actually bring that style back or yeah. share that style with your coworkers if you need to. And it doesn't, it's not huge, the file, the style. So right, it's right. very easy to bring back. And maybe this year you want this style, but next year you want a different style, but you want to keep the this year's because next year you want to come back to this year's to fix things. Yeah. So it's, it's complex how the world is and there's many ways to address it. And uh, these are things that we have never thought of when we began uh, meds. Interesting. Well, Justin, thank you for your time. And thanks for everybody who came to uh, to listen to this presentation. Um, so just a reminder, um, you know, check our website, lunageo.com slash webinars. Um, and we will be um, hosting others uh, in October. And I'll be announcing those probably in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, so take care. Thank you, Justin, again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Talking soon. Bye now. Bye.